Good evening, everyone. I hope you've all had a blessed and fulfilling day. Is that right? Very good, and I hope that our worship this evening is going to uh, add to your blessed experience. Let me tell you a story, an everyday story of ordinary folk and the choices they make. Ordinary people, but extraordinary choices. Challenging, life-changing, radical choices. This is the story of Ruth and Boaz. And their story begins at the beginning of the book of Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Marlon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they'd lived there for about ten years, both Marlon and Kilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons or her husband. So here we're introduced to the main characters in this story, to Naomi and uh, her family. And it's obvious that life has not been kind to these folk because they fled from famine in Judah only to find barrenness and death in Moab. Moab is a country just down the road, but not kindly disposed to Israelites. And Naomi finds herself in a desperate situation. Here she is in a foreign land, surrounded in a, by a foreign culture, no husband, no children, no family, no one to support her, and she needs to make a life-changing decision. Is she going to remain here in Moab, or is she going to return home to Bethlehem in Judah and somehow, by some means, as an old widow, support herself there? Well, she decides she's going to return to Bethlehem, and her two Moabite daughters-in-law, these two daughters-in-law, of course, are also widows themselves, they accompany her on, away, on the way. And then they come to the parting of the ways, and her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, they offer to go with, uh, with Naomi along the road on the da dangerous journey back to Bethlehem. But Naomi gives them some common sense advice. And she says, in, this is in verse 11, Naomi said, turn back my daughters, why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? That is, look, go back to Moab. That's the common sense thing to do. Look after your own interests. This is my tragedy. Don't make it yours as well. And so Orpah and Ruth have a choice to make. On the one hand, they can make the, the easy, respectable, and common sense choice to simply go back home to Moab, to their families. Or on the other hand, they can take the, the radical, the courageous choice and go with Naomi all the way to the foreign land of Judah and there, by some means or another, support this old woman in her, in her home village. Well, Orpah soon makes her choice. We're told, verse 14, that Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. That is, she kissed her goodbye. But Ruth makes a decision. And her choice is Ruth, it says, Ruth clung to her. She is not going to desert Naomi. Different women, different choices. They choose to do quite different things 
because they are quite different people. But we must be fair to Orpah. You know, Orpah is not wicked. She hasn't sold her soul to the devil in deciding to go back home. She's simply an ordinary woman who makes an ordinary choice, the kind that any average person with common sense would make. So let's not fail to see the choice that Ruth makes here. And ask yourself, would you have stayed with Naomi and gone on a journey to a land you didn't know? Especially when we recall that Naomi, yes, has had a hard deal in life, but she certainly knows it and reminds everybody at every point. So imagine walking with Naomi all the way from Moab to Bethlehem with her saying this. I'll just give you some selections here. She says, um, verse 13, No, my daughters, it's been far more bitter for me than for you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. And later she says, Call me no longer Naomi, which means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? And so it goes on. Imagine that every step of the way, all the way from Moab, all the way back to Bethlehem. And yet despite Naomi's complaints all the time, Ruth makes an astounding decision. This is what she says, verse uh, 16. Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Naomi doesn't have a single good word to say about God. She won't be giving any heartwarming testimonies in the Bethlehem midweek prayer meeting when she gets back about the Lord's leading in Moab. None of that. And yet Ruth, Ruth commits herself not only to Naomi, but to Naomi's God. A God that Naomi can find no good word to describe. And that is a thoroughly amazing, extraordinary choice that she makes. So at the crossroads between Moab and Judah stand Orpah and Ruth. Two different women, two different choices. And their choices remind me, in a way, of choices made in my own family. Uh, my father left school when he was only 14 with no formal qualifications but through sheer hard physical work manual labor he was earning a pretty good income and then he attended some meetings by uh, an adventist evangelist and that's when the problem started because he had to make a choice a choice between the financial security of the job that he was in or observing the Sabbath. He couldn't do both. My father chose his conscience rather than financial security. For the rest of his life earned less than half of what he'd been earning before. An ordinary man, but an extraordinary choice. And a choice which has affected my life right up to the present time. And Ruth's extraordinary choice means she ends up here in Bethlehem gleaning in the barley fields. Gleaners would pass across a field behind the, the harvesters, picking up the scraps of grain that the harvesters had missed. It was the work of the desperately poor who wanted to just keep body and soul together. And this is Ruth's plan to support herself and Naomi to go gleaning every day, backbreaking, heartbreaking work.
But here in the barley fields, some more choices are going to be made. And I think it's good if we just read the story a little, let it make its own point. And as I read these uh, few verses, I'd like you to ask yourself, what exactly is going on here? Why are people saying what they're saying? And why are they doing what they're doing? What is their motivation, do you think? So Ruth chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. As it happened, Ruth came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. And Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, To whom does this young woman belong? The servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I've ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, Go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Then she fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, Oh, why? Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me? And I'm only a stranger. But Boaz answered her, All that you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told me. And how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds. May you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. And then Ruth said, May I continue to find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you've comforted me, spoken kindly to your servant, even though... I'm not one of your servants. Well, you can almost, almost see Ruth's eyelids flutter as she speaks. See that uh, lovely blush come up on her cheeks as she speaks to Boaz. Hear the tone of voice in, in, that Boaz has. See his eyes linger on this young woman from Moab. But why are they doing what they're doing? Why are they saying what they're saying? Why is Boaz taking such a keen interest in this young woman? Is he falling in love with her? Or is he just wanting to do anything he can do to help a poor soul in distress? Or are his motives more sinister? And Ruth, Ruth, is she simply grateful to Boaz for showing her such kindness? Or do we detect that she might be flirting with him out there in the barley fields? And if so, why? It couldn't possibly be, could it? It couldn't possibly be that she is desperately poor and Boaz, we're told, is a very rich man. It couldn't have anything to do with that, surely. Is, is there a scheming heart beneath that pretty face of Ruth's? What would the average woman do in this situation? What would the average man do in this situation? What choices are they making? What possibilities are they turning over in their minds? Well, that becomes a little clearer as we move on to the next episode. Here we are at the beginning of Ruth chapter 3. Naomi, her mother-in-law. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter... I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now, here is Boaz, with whose young women you've been working. See, he's winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now, now, wash, 
put on perfume, put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He'll tell you what to do. She said to her, all that you tell me, I will do. Now I need to explain something at this point. Uh, as you probably know, the Bible, the Old Testament, normally calls a spade a spade. But sometimes it can be a little coy. And there's, a, look, I don't want to go into detail here too much, but the original language here is, is ambiguous. When Naomi says, uncover his feet, that could mean one of two things. It could, it, it could mean one of two things. It could mean, well, take off his socks, which, you know, depending on whose socks you're taking off, could be a, a memorable experience. It, it could simply mean that. But it's also a Hebrew idiom that could mean to be intimate with somebody. Now, if you really want to know why it means that, please see me afterwards. Okay. So what exactly is Naomi suggesting to Ruth? What is she suggesting that she would do? What exactly is going on? Well, let's read the next few verses and we get a better idea as to what's going on. Verse 6. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had instructed her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and he was in a contented mood, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And then she came quietly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and there, lying at his feet, was a woman. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your cloak over your servant. So there we have them, Boaz and Ruth, alone, together, in the darkness, Nobody else knows they're there. They're away from everybody else. So, what choices might they have in this situation? Now, of course, if this were a Hollywood movie, we all know what would happen. What would inevitably happen in such a situation? And in any case, nobody would know. It's pitch black. Nobody knows they're there. You know, it's the decisions and choices we make when nobody else would know that really point to the heart of the kind of person we are. Choices we make when nobody else would know. But what becomes clear is this. Ruth has not come to Boaz to seduce him. No. She has come to do something even more daring than that. Completely audacious. Something so incredible takes your breath away. Remember we are living here in this story in a patriarchal society. A society where men call the shots and what Ruth decides she's going to do, she's going to defy social convention. What's going on here is simply this, that Ruth is proposing marriage to Boaz. Shock, horror. I'm surprised some of you haven't fallen off your chair. A woman proposing marriage to a man. Imagine what they'll be doing next. And amazingly, Boaz accepts. Now, there is a bit of a problem. 
Boaz says, yes. He doesn't say, sweetheart, but I'm sure he did. He said, yes, sweetheart. Of course, we'll get married. The, what got a problem? There's a custom around here, and there's a, a relative that we need to sound out first because he has first right of refusal. He might well want to marry you, but we'll see what he has to say. So that's what they do. So as this story moves towards its final gasp, the, the tension builds. You know, will Ruth and Boaz find bliss and happy married life together? Or will this other relative throw a spanner in the works and get Ruth to the altar instead? Well, Boaz approaches this other relative. And in order to explain this, we come to chapter 4 and verse 6. I need to paraphrase it because we're not quite sure of the background to this. Nobody fully understands what this relative is saying. So I'll paraphrase, wholly paraphrase on my part. What he says is, look, he says, I cannot marry Ruth. If I marry Ruth, I'm going to damage my own inheritance. It's going to go against me. No, look, you marry her because I can't. So although the reasons that he gives are not crystal clear, one thing is clear. He was, he was given a choice. And the choice was to marry Ruth, which in this culture would give her a, a home, a family, support for herself and Naomi. He could choose to help her when it would be at a, to disadvantage himself, or he can choose not to help at all. Well, as far as this fellow's concerned, it's no contest. How in the world can I possibly help Ruth marry her when it would be to my disadvantage? So, easy decision, easy choice to make. And then, we almost dab tears from our eyes as we realize that Boaz marries Ruth. That is the choice he made. Mind you, we might be tempted to say, wasn't much of a choice, was it? I mean, a young, attractive woman makes a move for him. He falls for her. Oh, lucky fellow. But Boaz knows something that we might have forgotten. More than one thing that we might have forgotten. Ruth is a Moabite. Not only a foreigner, but a member of the enemy. Moabites, implacable enemies of the Israelites. No self-respecting citizen of Bethlehem could possibly marry a Moabite. Just imagine what the neighbors would say. Who in the world, well, rather, who in Bethlehem, in their right mind, would marry a Moabite? Well, Boaz did. Boaz did. That was the choice he made. And another thing, even more important than that. We all know, Boaz knows, Ruth has been married before. For quite some years, actually, according to the story. Possibly married for up to ten years. And she has no children. She has no children. And in this culture, at this time, that could only mean one thing. Ruth is a barren woman. In a culture which prized a woman's fertility all above almost anything else. No man would knowingly marry a barren woman. But Boaz did. Boaz did. That was the choice he made. And almost more tears on our cheeks here as we turn to chapter 4 in the end and we read this, chapter 4, verse 13. 
So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Yet another barren woman in the Bible who conceives and gives birth to a significant child. And this significant child, they named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David, of King David, from whom the son of David, Jesus himself, is descended. And there the story ends. And in some ways, I think I'm hearing what you're asking. It's the kind of thing I used to ask at the end of many a student essay. So what? You know, this story has a number of interesting interludes, some fascinating little episodes, but ultimately, so what? Well, from beginning to end, this is a story concerning extraordinary choices made by ordinary people. And amid all of those choices, a remarkable fact emerges. The main character in this story remains in the shadows. The main character in this story is not Naomi, or Ruth, or Boaz. The main character is God. And yet God is barely mentioned in the story, and yet he is revealed from beginning to end. And how is that possible? How is it possible for God to be revealed in a story such as this? Because God makes himself known through the decisions, through the choices made by people who are committed to him, through the choices made by Ruth, the choices made by Boaz. In this story, there are no miracles. There are no wonders. The, the sea doesn't part. The mountains don't quake. The dead are not raised. And that's one thing this story wishes to tell us. Don't just look for God in the spectacular and the miraculous because God reveals himself to us mainly in the everyday activities of our everyday lives. From earning a living, washing the car, telling our children we love them, to uh, cleaning the carpet, peeling the potatoes, and more often than not, God is revealed through the choices made by people who are committed to him. They model for us and we model for the world the God in whom we believe. Ruth chose to put Naomi first when she didn't have to. She could easily have made the same decision as Orpah, turned around and gone home. Boaz did not have to marry Ruth. He could easily have made the decision of that other relative and said, well, I, you know, I don't really want to upset the neighbors. Uh, I think, uh, you know, try a dating agency, sweetheart. But he didn't. He made a courageous choice. And these extraordinary choices made throughout this story reveal to us the extraordinary God in whom Ruth and Boaz put their trust. A God of compassion, a God who supports the underdog, a God of faithfulness and commitment, integrity, a God who challenges the social conventions of the day, and a God who shows us what he's like through the choices made by those people who know him. You know, the temptation to be ordinary, it's a subtle and seductive temptation. And we fall for it every time we choose to be ordinary rather than extraordinary. When we say things like, you know, the ordinary church member, I mean, you can't expect the ordinary church member to study the Bible much and learn how the scriptures can change their lives. I mean, the ordinary church member, you know, just don't have time to get working in the community so that Christ is known amongst neighbors. 
the ordinary church member, you know, I mean, you can't expect them to live a life so conspicuously different from their neighbours that people are going to notice. Well, if there's one message we learn from the book of Ruth, it's this. God has not called any one of us to be ordinary. And we should never be satisfied with ordinariness. The problem is, and I include myself here, the problem is that we're so busy being ordinary, we have no time left to be extraordinary. And it's often down to the choices we make. So what kind of choices might we make? Choices like uh, those of Orpah and that other relative? Not wicked. No, we're not wicked. Just ordinary, average, run-of-the-mill, safe pair of hands, don't rock the boat. That'll keep the pastor happy. That kind of decision. Or choices like those made by Ruth and Boaz. Courageous, different, flagrantly different, that challenge the conventions that everybody else is happy to follow. And through those extraordinary choices, witness to the radical God who lives with us and surprises us day after day. So, do we want to see how God can make himself known through extraordinary choices made by ordinary people? If we do want to know, well, says the author of the book of Ruth. Let me tell you a story. <laughs>